bowed heads. Father, thank you uh, for the privilege of opening your word this morning. And when we do that, Father, we ask uh, for your blessing. And we claim your promise in James that uh, when we lack wisdom, you want to give that liberally without reproach to those who ask in faith. We do that now, Lord. We ask you to speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Welcome again. You know, we have a lot of visitors today. And we're glad that you're here yes. and that you've joined us. And <clears throat> I know the Lord has a blessing in store for all of us. The scripture reading is found in Luke chapter 18, uh, beginning in verse 1. And if you have your Bibles um, and you'd like to look that up, that would be great. Also in your bulletin is the scripture uh, reference sheet, so you don't uh, have to jot these things down. Um, they're there for you so you can spend some time uh, looking at them. Uh, Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, in, And he, Jesus, spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Amen. Saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear along with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? You know, you don't have to be a religious person, but you are, thank God. But you don't have to be a religious person in any way to recognize that we're living in times of distress. Amen. And you know, the atheist recognizes humanity is on the brink of something major. That's right. Yeah. You know, strange things are happening uh, yeah. in our world. Yeah. Uh, things that make absolutely no sense. Right. And I want to share a few examples with you. Um, in Australia, they, they just passed a bill banning LGBTQ conversion therapy. And that bill has passed Victoria's upper house and it's going to become law. And the bill, uh, it's conversion practices prohibition bill. It makes it illegal to try to help someone in a situation where they're living in sin and they want to come out of that. And so it's illegal to try and change or suppress a person's sexual orientation or gender identity in Australia. Wow. And so this law covers conversion practices in all settings. So in the healthcare system, it's illegal to do it there. In a religious organization, it's also illegal. And if a person is convicted, they face 10 years in jail and $10,000 wow. in fines. Wow. But that was interesting. Uh, another example, uh, the Oregon Department of Education, and they, they have asked their teachers to register for training that encourages ethnomathematics in, in an attempt to undo racism in mathematics. And I did just what uh, I saw some of you do. I shook my head, I said, this doesn't sound right. But let me explain it to you. It's designed for middle school teachers to make the use of what they call a toolkit for dismantling racism in mathematics. And so, you know, there's a couple of organizations that have partnered together. Um, California's San Mateo County Office of Education and then the Education True West um, with the Oregon Department of Education. And so, Part of this toolkit is a list of ways uh, that mathematics is racism and has infiltrated our classrooms. And the main problem being there is a focus on getting the right answer and showing your work. 
that's considered to be racist because they want an equitable outcome for all students. So even if you're wrong, if your answer is wrong, they want you to be right. And so this is real. This is, I'm not making this up. This is actually happening. <clears throat> and so um, it goes on. It says, the concept of mathematics, this is on the website there, the toolkit. The concept of mathematics being purely objective is unequivocally false. And teaching it is even much less so. And so that's the document for equitable math. It says, upholding the idea that there are right and wrong answers perpetuate objectivity as well as fear and open conflict. So in other words, when the teacher tells the student there is only one correct answer to the math problem three plus three, plus three that causes fear and independence, and in doing so, it is racist and not politically correct. This is where our world is. Is it, We're there now. I mean, it hasn't spread, but it has already begun. And so elementary school teachers are, are, are taking part in this. They're learning this. And they're going to send students into the world that cannot do math in the interest of political correctness. Um, the third example, the, uh, Barna and the Christian organization Impact 360, they did a study, and they found that 71% of Americans aged 13 to 21 agree with this idea. What is morally right and wrong changes over time based on society. So the overwhelming majority, 74%, agree that Morality changes with society. Our society, our world is changing. It has changed. You know, mankind isn't walking away from God. They are running from God. These are not subtle things. These are major, in-your-face things, and no one's apologizing. No one's, no one's apologizing. This, this is the way the world is today. Jonathan Merrow, he's from Impact 360. That's a, a, a Christian organization. This is what he said. This means literally that moral reality, what is right, moral truth shifts or changes as society shifts. This will have devastating consequences for everyone trying to live according to God's good design and flourish as he designed them to function in this world as his image bearers. So he sees the serious uh, outcome as a result of this thought process. In, order, in, in other words, the majority of 13 to 27 year olds believe the Bible is not the source of truth. That's what it boils down to. Nor is it our moral compass. The Bible is no longer our moral compass. What society tells us is moral, or what's happening in a culture, uh, that determines what, what moral morality is, not God's word. And so you see a problem, right? It's called moral relativism. And you know, society cannot last long with that principle being perpetrated and, and spread. That's right. Society can't last long. Because what happens is I become the determiner of what is moral and what is right and what is wrong instead of God and His Word. So society is falling apart. We need to recognize this. And you know, many will tell you, and not in the church obviously, but many will tell you that as a society, as a world, uh, with this political correctness, we are moving in the right direction. We are headed to a greater, a higher plane wow. in relationships and society. They think this stuff is great. These things that are happening, they're embracing and they're wonderful. And so, you know, if we hide our heads in the sand and pretend that this isn't happening, denying those things, um, it is preparing us to be deceived and to be caught unawares. So uh, let's go back to Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 1. <clears throat> now this parable is believed to have been shared 
uh, by Jesus around March of AD 31. Not long after Jesus raised Lazarus uh, from the dead in, in Luke chapter 11. And it applies particularly to our experience in the last days. Ellen White said this, Christ Object Lessons 164. She said, Christ had been speaking of the period just before his second coming and of the perils through which his followers must pass. With special reference to that time, he related the parable to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. And that's how Jesus began. Verse 1, it says, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. So more a fact of more than prayer being our duty, more so a spiritual necessity. Because he's relating this to the time in which we live, the trouble that lies ahead, the things that we're seeing. And you know of those things that I mentioned, we can do nothing about them. There's nothing we can do. We can't change the way people are writing these laws and doing all these things. Our hands in many, many, many respects are tied. And so we need to come to the realization that God is in charge and he's allowing these things to happen. We're not to get discouraged, but we can do what Jesus says here. We ought to pray, ought always to pray and not to faint. And so it's more a spiritual necessity than a requirement. You know, God's saying, you must do this. It's a necessity. He recognizes without it, we're doomed. And so when things are good, we need to pray. When things are not so good, we need to pray, right? Uh, when you feel like praying and when you don't feel like praying, you need to, we need to pray. Have you ever not felt like praying? Right, I think we've all been there. Throughout the day and the night... When you can't sleep, God has given you an opportunity to pray, right? Um, whether we see an answer or not, we need to keep praying. And then, you know, further Jesus says, uh, we're told not to faint. And that Greek word, it means to be weak, to fail, to lose heart, to become weary. He says, don't become weary. Just keep praying. You may not see any results right now, but it doesn't mean that God's not working. You know, I, I, when, when Michelle and I, after we were converted, we were, became Adventists together. And God worked on our, our uh, conversion at the same time because he knew something uh, about us and that was necessary. But then we found out that two churches had been praying for us. For how long? How many times, how long did they pray and say, well, we're not seeing any results we're not seeing any results, and thank God they didn't give up. They didn't become weary. They kept on praying because God's timing is perfect, right? And so don't faint. So the widow in the parable that I read to you, in verse 3 it says, And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. The widow in, in this parable was the most helpless person in society. In Jesus' day, a widow was the most helpless person, especially if she didn't have a son. Okay? And we can assume uh, safely that she did not have a son because he would have been going to bat for her because sons watched out for their mothers always, always. And so she was unable to secure her request in any other way. She couldn't. Uh, use money. She didn't have money to buy, um, you know, some help to get. She couldn't pay to have justice done, um, and she, so she's helpless. And you get this picture. She has great need, and the 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 literal translation is that she kept coming, a continuous act. Okay, she kept coming. It says, and there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him. You translate that Greek, it's she kept coming. A continuous act. So make a personal application. Of ourselves, we are helpless against the spiritual forces of darkness. Right? You recognize that, right? Um, Ephesians 6.12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, 
but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's our battle. So we are like the widow, and we need to keep coming to the Lord in prayer. Because all the widow had was her persistence. That's all she had. Revelation 14, 12. And the Lord gave this to me this morning. You know, when you read the Bible, if you're not distracted, if you're prayerful, you will see amazing connections. Um, amazing connections in Scripture. And so the Lord, you know, He opened my eyes to Revelation 14, 12 because there's a great connection here. The widow was what? She was persistent. And Revelation 14, 12, it's, it's the third angel's message, part of the third angel's message. It is, it is uh, a message so pertinent to us today. Here is the patience of the saints. This is the persistence. This is the persistence of the widow. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. It's all connected. So in, in Matthew, um, I'm sorry, in Luke 18, if you kept your place there. She says, avenge me of mine adversary. And that word is singular. It's not adversaries. It's adversary. It's talking about Satan. It's the same word, adversary, that you find in 1 Peter 5, 8, which says your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Same word. She is pleading with the judge for help with Satan. She asked the judge to avenge her adversary. And that word avenge, it means to vindicate, to retaliate, to punish, to make right, to band together. I like that, to band together. You know, you can picture the Lord coming alongside the tempted one and banding together and bringing heavenly power and strength. And so the parable is an example in contrast because we don't like what we read about the judge and that's not God's character, okay? It, it, the judge in the parable doesn't care for his people. He doesn't care for his people. He is wearied. He's greatly annoyed by this woman, by her regular pleadings, her constantly coming to him with her petitions, her prayers for help, he is greatly annoyed. The Lord Jesus, the, the great judge, he loves us. He loves his people. He is never wearied. We do not bother him by coming to him and, and bringing the same petition to him, not giving up, not being weary, and remembering, you know, if you're praying for your children, you, you just keep bringing it, keep bringing it, because we don't know what he's doing in the background. We don't know what he's doing in the heart. And, and so we don't get weary, and we just continually come. The Lord's banding together. He, he's going to avenge. He's going to do the job. And so... The Lord is never wearied. You know, Hebrews 4, 16, we're told to come boldly to the throne of grace. Not leave me alone, you bother me. He says, come boldly to the throne of grace to find mercy and grace in time of need. And so uh, that's the contrast. The judge in the parable, he doesn't care. And he is wearied. He's bothered. It's the only reason that he helps her because he's sick of it. Just get done with it. But our God, He loves us. He wants to help us. He's not wearied. In, in Luke 18, 7, notice what it says. And shall not God avenge His own elect, which cry day and night unto Him, though He bear long with them? Notice He describes His people in the last days, they cry day and night. They're persevering in prayer because they're on the brink. They recognize that we are on the brink of 
the second coming, of the time of trouble uh, that you know, we can't imagine. We're on the brink of Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. And so they cry unto him day and night. Those are the ones that he says that he will avenge speedily. Shall not God avenge his own that cry unto him day and night? Ellen White said this, The judge who is here pictured has no regard for right, nor pity for suffering. The widow who presses her case before him was persistently repulsed. Again and again she came to him only to be treated with contempt and to be driven away from the judgment seat. But she, was, she would not fail nor become discouraged. That's the lesson for us. Don't fail nor become discouraged. She goes on, Notwithstanding his indifference and hard-heartedness, she pressed her petition until the judge consented to attend to her case. The judge yielded to the widow's request merely through selfishness, that he might be relieved of of, of her constantly coming to him. He felt for her no pity or compassion. Her misery was nothing to him. Christ here draws a sharp contrast between the unjust judge and God. That's why he he laid this parable out that way, so we could see the contrast between the evil judge and our loving God. How different is the attitude of God towards those who seek Him? The appeals of the needy and distressed are considered by Him with infinite compassion. Isn't that good news? He recognizes your need. The unjust judge had no special interest in the widow who pestered him for deliverance. Yet in order to rid himself of her pitiful appeals, he heard her plea and delivered her from her adversary. But God loves his children with infinite love. To him the dearest object on earth is his church. So in verse 8, the Lord promises he will avenge them speedily, with haste. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on earth. When the Son of Man cometh. When he comes, when Jesus comes, will he find faith on earth? Because prior to and, and when Jesus returns, it will seem as though evil has triumphed over good. That's what makes me anxious when I read the news. When I see those reports, I get anxious and I have to put myself in check. I, I need to be anxious for nothing. But, but when I see evil triumphing over good, when I see injustice, and the world is full of injustice, And wrongs not being righted, it can make a person anxious. And so this is how the world is now, and this is how it will progressively increase and get worse until Jesus comes. And it's going to seem as though the wicked have prevailed over the righteous. And and this belief that moral standards change, uh, we're going to see that that appears to have conquered over the supreme truth of God's word. It's going to look like God is losing. And that the church is losing. It's failing. But though the church appears to fall, yet will it what? Stand. It's going to stand. Right? God's people will feel like Jacob. And that we're going to feel like God has left us. There's a, there's a period of testing, of trial. Uh, the refiner's fire, remember that. That's, a, that's an experience that we're going, to, we're going to go through. And it's going to feel like God has abandoned us to suffer and to fall at the hands of Satan and his minion. That's the feeling that we're going to have. But will God's people maintain their faith through prayer? And the study of God's word and his promises, as Revelation 14, 12 said. You know, Revelation 14, 12 is describing the sealed of God. It's describing God's people. 
They're patient and they have the faith of Jesus. So don't forget that. Don't forget that. So we have to make a connection now with Matthew 24. If you'll go there, Matthew 24. And we're going to begin in verse 12. Matthew 24, beginning in verse 12. Let me know when you're there. Are you there? Verse 12, Jesus says, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax what? Shall wax cold. But he that endure unto the end shall be saved. But he that shall endure unto the end shall be saved. Because iniquity shall abound. In other words, the transgression of God's law. Unrighteousness shall flourish as though Satan has won the war. That's what Jesus says. He's talking about the last days. Iniquity shall abound. Transgression will be everywhere. Unrighteousness is going to flourish as though Satan has won. He says, the love of many shall wax or grow cold. And you know, it occurred to me that this is not only talking about love for one another. And you know, um, there's, a, there's examples of this. You know, if a person is exposed to, you know, acts of violence and crime and, and terrible things, they, they can get a hard heart. So that, oh, that's too bad. And then, you know, you just move on to the next report and it, it has little or no effect. Um, and, and I believe that that is what Jesus is talking about. But in a greater way, I believe that he is talking about our love for God. Mankind's love for God will grow cold. Because it appears as though Satan is winning. It, it appears as though God has lost control when he hasn't. And the, the love of many will grow cold, will wax cold for each other, no longer caring for each other, and certainly not caring for God. Because the two of those go together. If you love God, you will love your fellow man. In Zephaniah chapter 1 and verse 14, the Bible says this, The great day of the Lord is near, it is near, and hasteneth greatly, even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. So, so what is Zephaniah saying here? He's telling us that we're on the brink. The great and mighty day of the Lord is very near. It's hurrying upon us. It's coming on rapidly. And as a result, men ought always to pray and not to faint. That's what Jesus is saying. So what is the main issue in these last days? Southern Watchman, June 28, 1904. It is on the law of God that the last great struggle of the controversy between Christ and his angels and Satan and his angels will come. And it will be decisive for all the world. See, the law of God has been the great controversy since Revelation 12 in verse 7, the, the war in heaven. It's, it's all about the law of God. That's the main issue. It is going to be, it is and it will continue to be the polarizing force. Yeah. It will determine what side a person is on. The law will do that. Yeah. And as we see society doing ridiculous things, ridiculous things happening, when, when we see that, and laws are passed that are ridiculous, or they go against what God's word says, the world is polarized. Everyone will make a choice. And, and to follow God will be unpopular. It, it is, it's already hated in many, in many respects. Perhaps you've experienced that. Maybe family, friends have, you know, just, I don't want anything to do with you anymore. And, and so doing what God wants us to do, following His law, yeah. is going to be unpopular, uncomfortable. Yeah. And it's going to polarize the world. We're on the brink. The great mighty day of the Lord is near. It's very near. Yeah. 
Sound an alarm throughout the length and breadth of the earth. Tell the people that the day of the Lord is near and hasteneth greatly. Let none be left unwarned. According to the truth we have received above others, we are debtors to impart the same to them. Amen. Testimonies, volume 6. and You have the reference there. And so we have this truth, and we're to tell the people. I believe we have a solemn duty to impart present truth, to share the truth. To our brothers and sisters in the church, believe it or not, lovingly you, you, you embrace someone and, and you share the truth in the church, in your home, and then with those that you come in contact with outside the church as God makes those appointments. But aren't we to lift each other up? Amen. Last time I stood here, we talked about um, bearing each other's burdens, right? And, and, and keeping that commandment to love God and to love each other, right? And part of that love is to help each other. And, and that includes sharing the truth. Don't overlook sin in your brother or sister. Because the Bible is clear. We are responsible for that. Their blood will be on our hands. But do it in love. Do it in love. If you can't do it in love, don't do it. <clears throat> so we have a solemn duty, I believe. So what is it about the law? Um, I'm just going to share a few um, scriptures with you. And you have the references here. Psalm 19, 7 and 8. Very powerful. He says, the, Lord, the law of the Lord is perfect doing what? Converting the soul. The law of the Lord is perfect converting the soul. And aren't we desirous of those around us being converted? And it goes on. It says, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right. Rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. All positives. Every one of those things are positive, right? right. But, but Satan has painted a picture that the law is somehow bad. Oh, yeah. But just in those two verses, you see, perfect, converting the soul. It's sure. It's, it makes wise. It, the, the, the statutes are right. Um, Rejoicing the heart, the Lord is pure, the commandment of the Lord is pure, and it enlightens the eyes. And, and so, so what just occurred to me in reading the end of that, it, it should bring you right to the church of Laodicea, and, and we need Isav, right? And, and so here we see a connection. The law of God enlightens the eyes, our spiritual eyesight. And then Deuteronomy 6, 6 and 7 and these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Don't keep them to yourself. And shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and, while, and, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. It, it, they need to be part of our lives. Part of your life, share it, talk about it. And, and then you'll see that your home has an atmosphere of heaven. Amen. Deuteronomy 30, verse 16. Deuteronomy 30, 16. In that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. The Lord wants to bless you. He wants to bless me. And, and, and God's law is, is designed to be embraced and bring blessing. And then Deuteronomy 28, 1, and finally, And it shall come to pass... Deuteronomy 28, 1. If thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all the nations of the earth. And I take that to uh, speak of eternal life. 
Because the Lord is going to raise his people up above any nation that has ever existed. And so there's a blessing promised over and over in Scripture um, as a result of keeping the law of God. It is for our good always. It's not to be a burden. It's not to save you. Um, It's for your good, for my good. Christ Object Lessons 166, the widow's prayer, avenge me, do me justice of mine adversary, represents the prayer of God's children. Satan is their great adversary. He is the accuser of our brethren who accuse them before God day and night. He is continually working to misrepresent and accuse, to deceive and destroy the people of God. And it is for deliverance from the power of Satan and his agents that in this parable Christ teaches his disciples to pray. You see that is perfect fit. Jesus is calling us to pray always and not to faint because of what Satan is throwing at us. We're nearing the close of earth's history. We are on the brink. And we have before us a great work to do. It's a closing work, right? To share the three angels' messages, present truth. People need to know this. And if we think that we can do it, I have, I have room to grow in the prayer department. Am I alone? Is there anybody else that sees it? You know, we can always do better. And you look at Jesus' example. The divine son of God. And boy, he prayed to tears, right? Many times. Uh, we, We need to pray always and not faint. Don't give up. Because we're nearing the end. We're very close. We're on the brink. And now is the time to fortify, to draw closer. You know, you can know all the 28 fundamental beliefs, know all the doctrines, be very smart, know the Hebrew, the Greek, Uh, the Aramaic, and if you don't have a relationship, you'll you'll be found wanting. Um, The relationship is that that constant prayer, that talking and listening. You know, I, I would venture to say the majority of us could do a better job listening because isn't life hectic? Aren't we, we got this responsibility and this and this and the clock rules us. I've got to be there by this time. I'm greeting this morning. I've got to be there by nine. And, and so, and what happens is we, we say our prayers and then we leave. And we're not listening. God wants to bless you. He wants to speak to your heart. And so if we have to back up 10 or 15 minutes so that we can still be responsible um, at our jobs and with our family and with our church, We need to back up 10 or 15 minutes so we can hear God. He wants to speak to you. He wants to speak to me. And in eternity, I want him to say, boy, I'm so glad that you made those changes in your prayer life because, boy, could you imagine what you would have missed out on if you weren't listening? You know, a relationship is two-way communication. If Franklin stops listening to Virginia, that's not a good relationship. And so... Uh, if, if we stop listening to God, that's not a good relationship. We just keep telling Him what we need and what we want, and we don't listen. That's not good. And so let's listen to our spouses, and let's certainly listen to God too, right? And so uh, keep this in mind. Prayer is the key to holding that relationship together. Let's kneel and pray. Father God, we're uh, so thankful that you desire to draw close to us. And and you're constantly trying. Uh, You're a relentless pursuer of your children. And we thank you for that. But Lord, we're the ones that um, keep our distance. And we're we're not spending enough time in prayer, perhaps, and we're not staying to listen. Lord, help us to do that. We recognize we're on the brink of the end of this world as we know it. That you are going to come and avenge the elect. You're going to come and make things right. And you're going to do it speedily. It's going to happen fast. And you're going to make short the work. 
And so, Lord, let us not put it off another moment, but let us uh, do as you have counseled us to do, um, to pray always and not to faint. And, and Lord, you know our hearts, and that's our heart desire today. We ask you that you, through the Holy Spirit, would make that a reality in our lives. And we thank you so much uh, for hearing our prayer and for answering us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we stand and sing our closing hymn, hymn number 448, Oh, when shall I see Jesus? So thankful that we're living, Lord, in a time when we would see you coming. Amen. We may be privileged to see you coming in the clouds of glory, to see uh, the end of all things before our eyes and, and be translated to the kingdom of heaven, to reign with our Savior forever. And Lord, that's our heart desire. We're not here because anyone forced us to come. We're here, Lord, to worship our Creator because we have a hope, a hope in Jesus a hope to live eternally with the one who suffered and died for us. And so, Lord, as we go here, for, uh, we go from this place now, Lord, may we be forever, always, and constantly in prayer, speaking uh, to you as to a friend. Uh, bless us all to that end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.